All right, Revelation chapter 2 this morning, verses 8 through 11. And this is the message to the church at Smyrna. Revelation chapter 2, verses 8 through 11. It's uh, the second church that Jesus is addressing uh, in his letter to the seven churches found in Revelation chapters 2 and 3. The letter to the church at Smyrna. So let's pray. Father, we do thank you for your word this morning. Uh, As your word says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And so, Lord, as as we are your people, we we make up the church. We pray that you will give us an, an ear to hear what you would say to us this morning. Lord, we know that these uh, messages to the seven churches, that they are applicable to our lives today, just like the letter to the Corinthians was applicable to us. Lord, the letter to the Romans or the Thessalonians. And so the letter to the church at Smyrna, to the angel of the church of Smyrna, write. And so we ask God that you will speak into our lives. We pray that you'll help us to approach your word this morning with anticipation that there is uh, that there is the word of the Lord here for us this morning as well as for the church in Smyrna originally we thank you for these things father in Jesus name amen all right so let's um let's read Revelation chapter 2 verses 8 through 11 together it says and to the angel of the church of Smyrna write these things says the first and the last He who was dead and came to life. I know your works, tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. So the letter to the church at Smyrna. Um, The the suffering church, uh, the church at Smyrna, And so as we have read uh, the text this morning, we see that um, they were undergoing suffering and that there was further suffering that they were going to be experiencing as Jesus encouraged them not to fear it, uh, Jesus to uh, encourage them to be faithful uh, unto death and that he would give them the crown of life. And so this was a body of believers that was suffering Uh, someone said that God only has one son who is sinless, but God doesn't have any sons who are not going to suffer. All of God's servants suffer at one time or another, even God's own son, Jesus Christ, suffered in his faithfulness to God in paying for the sins of the world. So Smyrna, this church, Um, existing at the same time as Ephesus, which is interesting because they're not suffering in Ephesus. So it's like, well, Lord, why why are you allowing the believers to suffer in Smyrna? If you are blessing the church at Ephesus, then how come the church in Smyrna uh, is impoverished? How come they're going to be persecuted? Uh, How come the church in Smyrna is so different than from Ephesus And we'll be looking at that uh, this morning as we make our way through the passage, and we'll see that God is is sovereignly in control uh, of what he allows, and the Lord is allowing their suffering for a purpose, and they're going to glorify God in the lives that they live. And this happens to be the plan for the ministry there in Smyrna at this time. And so we're going to be looking at that as we make our way through. So Smyrna was located about 35 miles north of Ephesus. And even as Ephesus was a seaport, uh, so was the city of Smyrna. It actually has a very large and beautiful harbor, a seaport there in Smyrna. 
Um, it was a very large and wealthy city, and uh, Smyrna is still in existence today. It's the city of Izmir today, Izmir. And uh, you can Google Izmir and check it out, and you'll see that um, it is still a very prosperous city. It is the third largest city in Turkey, I am told. And so um, there was this, uh, this church that was there in Smyrna. And uh, in the word Smyrna, you'll notice the myrrh, Smyrna. Uh, the word that we get for myrrh uh, in the Bible is associated with this word Smyrna, which is appropriate. And um, myrrh, of course, was a, um, was a perfume. Um, it was used in the anointing oil. Myrrh was used in the anointing oil in Exodus chapter 30. Myrrh was used in the beauty treatments of uh, Esther chapter 2. Uh, myrrh is used, um, uh, speaking of uh, it, the fragrance of myrrh uh, concerning the Messiah in Psalm 45, verses 6 through 8, which says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You love righteousness and hate wickedness. Therefore, God, your God has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. All your garments are scented with myrrh and aloes and acacia out of the ivory palaces by which they have made you glad. So there the first uh, reference to myrrh uh, being associated uh, with the Messiah we remember that myrrh was a part of the gifts that were brought to Jesus at his birth. And so uh, there in Matthew, I believe it's chapter 2, they presented to him gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Myrrh was also associated with Jesus' death, for after he died on the cross, oh, excuse me, while he was um, being crucified, during the time of his crucifixion, it says that they gave him wine mingled with myrrh to drink, the scripture says, but he would not take it. And so this city of Smyrna, its name uh, being associated with myrrh and uh, the different uses uh, for myrrh in the Bible. We remember that at Jesus's burial, that Nicodemus came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, it says in John chapter 19, about 100 pounds. And so uh, myrrh was frequently used in um, anointing the body at death. They would uh, wrap the body uh, and they would wrap spices into the cloth as they would wrap the body for burial. And myrrh was one of those uh, spices. How appropriate uh, for the suffering church. And uh, no doubt as this church was going through persecution, that the fragrance of their faithfulness to God was uh, ascending before the throne of the Lord. And so um, the Lord introduces himself uh, as he instructs John, write to the angel of the church of Smyrna, these things says the first and the last, Jesus, talking about his eternal nature, the first and the last. And then Jesus' conquering of death. He introduces himself as the one who was dead and came to life. And so these things are a, a reference out of chapter 1, as Jesus, the glorified Jesus makes himself known in chapter 1. He speaks of himself there as the one who is the first and the last and the one who was dead and came to life. Um, you can read about that in uh, verse 18 of chapter 1. And so Jesus appropriately um, relates to them as the one who was dead and came to life because Jesus is going to ask this church to be faithful to him, to be faithful unto death. Now, whether they were going to die for their faith or, or whether they would simply need to be faithful until death. However it came, 
Uh, the exhortation applies to both. But as Jesus would say, I know, verse 9, I know your works, tribulation, he says, and, and poverty. Jesus says these things as one who was dead and came to life. Jesus said in John chapter 5, For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself. Jesus is encouraging the suffering church that if they should have to lay down their lives and their faithfulness to God, so Jesus has been granted to give life to whom he will, that he has life in himself. And we see at the end of the letter, he promises uh, them eternal life and being spared from the second death. Jesus said in John eleven twenty six, whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. I am he who lives and was dead and came to life. And he who believes in me shall never die. As Jesus conquered the destiny of death that all people face, the Lord has overcome and conquered what happens to a person after their physical body is laid in the tomb. Jesus said, He who lives and believes in me shall never die. Jesus says to the church at Smyrna uh, that uh, they will be spared from the second death, which is speaking um, of giving them the assurance of everlasting life that is in him. So Jesus says to them, I know your works, tribulation and poverty. Jesus says, but you are rich. Don't you love that, that Jesus just rejoices in this church? You know, they're, they're outward circumstances. Jesus says, listen, I know your works. I know your faithfulness. I know that in, in all of your faithfulness, you're experiencing tribulation. And because of your tribulation, you are finding yourself in poverty. But what does Jesus say? It's almost like Jesus leans in and with a smile, he says, but you are rich. Because the Lord is looking upon their spiritual life. Now, the church at Ephesus, they had left their first love. They had so many wonderful things going, but they had left their first love. Jesus says, I have this against you. To the church at Smyrna, this is a suffering church, and no rebuke is given to it. And Jesus points out that in the midst of their outward tribulation and poverty, the effect of it all has kept their souls in a very rich condition before him. And often that is the case. When believers are going through times of persecution and suffering, we really draw near to the Lord. And you know, Jesus was rejoicing in this church and the richness of their faith. James wrote in chapter 2, verse 5, and he said, Listen, my beloved brethren, has not God chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love them? Him, rather. So this church is both rich in faith and they are rich uh, by Jesus' estimation concerning the rewards that they are going to be receiving. The eternal kingdom that they are going to be inheriting is going to come with such rewards. Jesus is like, guys, I know things are tough. I'm putting words in Jesus' mouth, right? Guys, I, I see that things are tough. I know that you, you wish that things were different, but Jesus would say this, let me tell you, from eternity's point of view, you are rich. Jesus said, I see that you are rich in faith. And Jesus has no rebuke for them like he does for the rest of the churches. And so Jesus knows the rewards that he is going to bestow upon his suffering servants. And Jesus says, look, you guys, you are rich in my estimation. And so what a blessing it is that the Lord knows what we're going through. Amen. That the Lord knows our tribulation. It's not like we say, oh, Lord, I'm facing trouble sometimes. It's not like the Lord says, ah, eh, so what, you know? 
No, the Lord says, I know. He says, I know your tribulation and your poverty. It's like, Lord, well, if you know our poverty, why don't you change things? God has a purpose. He knows what he's doing. The Lord says, you are rich. And so I believe that is on account of of the things that they were going through, that they were experiencing a very richness in faith, and they were going to be receiving a very richness of reward. And the Lord is pleased with these people. And so Jesus goes on in verse 9, and he says, And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. I like these words. I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but they are of the synagogue of Satan. You see, the Jews in Smyrna were persecuting the Christians. They were the source of the spiritual warfare that they were going through. We see, we see the devil mentioned a little bit further down in the text, and the devil was using the Jewish community to persecute the Christian community. And so, you know, the, the accusations that were made by the Jews Uh, We see the accusations uh, made against the Apostle Paul. You know, uh, you teach men everywhere to forsake Moses. Paul's like, I'm not teaching people to forsake Moses. And uh, uh, we we see the the persecution that Stephen uh, experienced. uh, As they said, this man has spoken against Moses and spoken against this holy place, Jerusalem. And they stoned Stephen as he was trying to make his uh, defense before the people. And so, you know, many times when we're being accused of things that we're not guilty of, it wars in the mind. The enemy uses it like fiery darts. He shoots it at us. But isn't it a blessing when we understand that the Lord knows the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not. And when the Lord would go so far to say, but they are of the synagogue of Satan. In other words, the Lord affirms his servants while denouncing his enemies in a a word of comfort to this church that was going through so much because of their belief and faithfulness to Jesus. Now, concerning the the Jews uh, being of the synagogue of of Satan, um, you know, Paul says in Romans chapter 2 that a person is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. Jesus looked upon the synagogue there where the Torah was being read, the prophets, the law, the prophets, where prayers were being offered, religious people. The Lord would say, they're not true Jews. They're not true Jews. They're of the synagogue of Satan. You remember um, that Jesus said, as he was talking to the Jews at one time, uh, he said, if, if you were Abraham's children, because they had claimed, hey, we're Abraham's children. Uh, we've never been in bondage to anyone. So in John 8, Jesus said, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth, which I heard from God. Jesus points out, Abraham did not do this. Jesus said, you do the deeds of your father. Then Jesus said this this to the Jews. He said, you are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth. So here in, in Revelation, this is not the first time that Jesus has spoken of the unbelieving Jews as being under the influence of the devil. And so um, Jesus speaks of of the religious Jewish community as uh, speaking blasphemously against the Christians who were there. Um, They they claim to be Jews, and, and Jesus says they are not. But Jesus says they are of the synagogue of Satan. So what a what a revelation to these 
suffering Christians, right? You can picture these Christians, you know, they're suffering and they're, they're like, man, our countrymen, our, our Jewish brethren, I mean, we were once a part of the synagogue, and, but the way they're treating us, and you can imagine them saying, man, those guys, man, it, it's like they're of the devil, man. They're causing us such trouble. The poverty probably relates to people losing their jobs because they couldn't practice their trade because they were being banished out of uh, the Jewish society that was there. Um, and, and so what a comfort to hear Jesus speak of them as the synagogue of Satan. It's like, I knew it. <laughs> I knew it. It's just, it's just a comfort. It's not that you want to hear the Lord talk bad about other people. That, that's not what you want. But it's just that you're, you get affirmed that you're heading in the right direction. As you are clinging to Jesus and clinging to his word, he sees, he acknowledges, and he affirms you while denouncing those who are persecuting you as they are uh, rejecting and, and forsaking the word of the Lord. So I know, Jesus says, your works, tribulation, poverty, Jesus says, but you are rich. Rich to the Lord. Jesus says, but you are rich. Uh, you know, I think it's so important that we value the Lord's estimation of us above all other things. We want Jesus to look upon us and say, you are rich as you are trusting in me. And Jesus says, and I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not but are of the synagogue of Satan. Now, Jesus says in verse 10, do not fear. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison uh, that you may be tested and you will have tribulation 10 days. So, um, Jesus uh, brings up now the, the spiritual warfare that is involved in this church. You know, people are like, oh, I want to go to the church at Ephesus, man. They got good music. They got good children's ministry. You know, they got donuts every service. We love this place. And, and, and they, you know, they, don't go to the church in Smyrna. It's tough there. <laughs> but what was, the, what, what, was the, what was behind the scenes? Well, in Ephesus, in their case, they were losing their first love because of their ease of life. But Smyrna, on account of their suffering and their clinging to God in faithfulness through it, they were rich. And Jesus pointed out that there was a huge spiritual battle going on behind the scenes. The devil himself, Jesus speaks of him, the devil himself had his fingers in the church at Smyrna. He was picking at them. He was trying to get at them. And the Lord was allowing the people there to be tested in order to bring glory unto God. Oh, when these saints made it into heaven and they understood for the first time the, the, the details of the fierce spiritual warfare that was taking place as they clung to Jesus and the glory that they brought to God because these people cannot see God with their eyes and yet they trusted him and their lives were suffering on account of their faithfulness. Oh, how thankful they were in glory that, that they had endured uh, the testing. And so how important that is for us, guys. We don't see what's going on in the eternal realm. What we have, guys, is the word of God. We need to cling to the word of God. We need to do the word. We need to believe the word. We need to walk according to the word. We need to keep our eyes on the word and not on the people that are around us or churches and other places or why is, you know, so-and-so down the street? He gets blessed at his job, but I'm getting persecuted at my work. And, you know, all of these things, we've got to keep our eyes on the Lord, keep our eyes on the word of God. Because there is a glory, a day of eternity that we are all going to step into. Not a one of us shall be left behind. We shall all leave this earth one day and step into eternity. And there we will see 
the cause for many of the difficulties that we face. And we'll be so glad that the Holy Spirit helped us to cling to the word. We'll be so glad we had godly friends that encouraged us just keep trusting God. We'll be so glad for Bible studies and, uh, you know, online messages and different things that helped us to humble ourselves and just to cling to the word of God. He says to this church, do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Now, if Jesus was telling me this, do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Suffer. If he paused for a moment, I would say, oh, I got a question. <laughs> Don't fear any of those things that are about to suffer. My hand goes up as soon as he pauses. Why do I have to suffer? If you know that I'm going to suffer, can't you keep me from it? He says, indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison. This is not the first time that the Lord has announced to his people that the devil is about to come in a pointed attack. You remember what the Lord said to Peter? He said, Peter, Satan has asked for you that he might sift you as wheat. And so this takes place in the church. We see it happening here in Smyrna. The spiritual battle is raging. Now, as the devil is about to throw some of them into prison, it's not like the devil's going to show up, you know, in his red suit and his forked tail and horns on his head and, you know, drag them off to jail. But he's using those from the synagogue. He's using those to raise up persecution, those people in the synagogue, to raise up persecution. And those physical people are the ones who are going to uh, facilitate the arrests of these Christians, the imprisonment of these Christians. And that's why the Bible says that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. You know, now is a good time to remember that. Amen? We do not wrestle against flesh and blood. But ultimately, we're wrestling against principalities and powers, against the spiritual host of wickedness in the heavenly places. We need to remember that, guys. There is a spiritual battle that is going on. Now, some might fault me saying, oh, well, Eric, are you saying we should do nothing in the political realm? Are you, think, are you saying we should do nothing, you know, in the streets? No, I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is, while our attention is focused on hating our brother, there is a principality and a power behind the way the devil is using that person. And we need to realize that the battle is ultimately won on our knees, okay? Some people don't like that I teach these things. Some people want to go uh, fellowship at other churches that are more um, uh, focused on the practical things uh, of this world. And that's fine because those churches have a place and they have a work to do just like we do. Um, so um, we just need to understand. We just need to understand. He says, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested. And Jesus said, and you will have tribulation 10 days. This reminds me so much of the book of Job. The book of Job reveals that there was an occasion when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. We presume that those are the angels. And the devil came among them. And uh, we read that the Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? And Satan said, well, I've come from uh, walking upon the face of the earth, uh, walking back and forth on it. And the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless man, an upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil. So Satan answered the Lord and said, ah, Does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him, around his household, and around all that he has on every side? 
You've blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in your hand. Satan said, But now stretch out your hand toward him and all that he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not lay a hand on his person. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. So much like in the book of Job, where the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not put your hand on his person. So the Lord has granted that the devil would be used to test these believers. And so, you know, we, we hear then about the suffering of Job and, and we see the, the, the faithfulness of God in Job's life through his suffering. And then we see once the testing is done, the scripture says you've heard of the patience of Job and you see the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very gracious and compassionate and how the Lord, after allowing his servant to suffer, how he re rewarded him so greatly in the end. So this church in Smyrna, for the purpose of glorifying God, the devil is going to come down to it. He is going to use those Jewish uh, people to persecute the Christians, and they're going to throw them in prison. The Bible says that you may be tested, Jesus said, and you will have tribulation 10 days. So did they have uh, tribulation? Were they thrown in the slammer 10 literal days? Uh, maybe. Uh, uh, how long have you ever spent in jail? <laughs> um, most commentators think uh, that the, the idea of 10 days is the idea of you're going to be thrown into a prison for a specified amount of time. In other words, there is a time for this persecution to start and there is a time for this persecution to end. Uh, many commentators believe that that's what the 10 days is a reference to. You're, you're free to see it however you like. Some see it as waves of persecution that came by 10 different emperors uh, over church history. Um, uh, uh, there in Rome, um, that's quite possible too. But even then, the idea there is that there is a time for the persecution to begin and there is a time for the persecution to end. They were already in tribulation and poverty, but there was a, a spike in the persecution that was coming. But in the Lord's hand was its beginning and end. Even as with Job, the book of Job has a beginning and the book of Job has an end. And between the opening chapter and the closing chapter, in the middle of it is the sufferings of Job. But it had a beginning in the Lord's sovereignty. The Lord granted Satan a freedom, but then it had an end. The Lord said, that's enough. And so um, these believers can be comforted that their sufferings have an end. Jesus says to them at the end of verse 15, be faithful until death. Now, that doesn't mean that they were all going to die from the suffering. Maybe some did in Smyrna. I don't know. But the exhortation is be faithful until death. And that applies to all of us. Amen. For us to be faithful unto God until death. Verse 10, do not fear. The end of verse 10, be faithful. Do not fear be faithful unto death. Jesus says, and I will give you the crown of life, for in his hands are the keys of Hades and of death. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, Jesus says, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches he who overcomes, Jesus said, shall not be hurt by the second death. Now, the Bible presents two deaths uh, to us. It, it presents to us 
uh, the death of our physical body. And then the Bible presents uh, that being in hell, being condemned to hell, as a second death. Uh, so to die once physically, that is your first death. All people, uh, unless the rapture comes, will, will experience the first death. But unbelievers, unfaithful unbelievers, they will experience a second death, which is eternal separation from God. So Revelation chapter 20, verse 6 references this. It says, Blessed and holy is he who is part in the first resurrection. Over such, Jesus says, the second death has no power, but they shall be priests to God and of Christ and shall reign with him for a thousand years. Speaking of the kingdom age. So the second death, a reference there in Revelation chapter 20. The second death is having to live with the consequences of your sin for all eternity, and that consequence being uh, separated from God for all eternity. And so, you know, I would just encourage anyone that is listening, you know, if you don't know for certain that you will go to heaven when you die, you should turn to Jesus Christ today. Because Jesus will give you the gift of eternal life and you'll know in your heart and you'll know because of what the word of God says that you will live forever in heaven with God. If you're unsure whether or not your sins have been forgiven, you really need to take that question to Jesus and you need to confess to Jesus that you have sinned against him and ask him to forgive you. The Bible says if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If you get your life right with God tonight, you will not experience the second death. So I would encourage you not to wait, but to get your life right with God tonight. And so um, the letter to the church of Smyrna, the suffering church, Jesus says, I know. I know what you're going through now. I know the spiritual warfare that is coming. The devil is absolutely involved, but I've set limits upon it. Jesus says, do not be afraid. You know, Jesus said, do not fear him who can kill the body. Jesus said, fear him who, after he has killed the body, has the power to throw the soul into hell. Jesus says, yes, I say to you, fear ye him. God is infinitely greater than the devil. And God has this church of Smyrna securely in his hands. Their eternal destiny is secure. Though the devil has been granted permission uh, to trouble them, they are going to be tested. But they are going to glorify God with their testimony. And Jesus looks upon their hearts and says, You are rich. Father, we thank you that you are sovereignly in control of our lives. And Lord, we don't know to the extent of spiritual warfare that, that takes a place in our life, in our homes, in our church. We don't know the extent, Lord. But thank you for the light that we have been given, the light in your word. And help us, Lord, having done all, to stand in the armor of God. And help us to trust you, Lord. We ask, Father, that you would fight our battles. That you, Lord, as the enemy comes in like a flood, that you would raise up a standard. And that you would deliver us from evil. You taught us to pray this way. Deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Well, all right. So God bless you guys. Just a little uh, note here. There is still a church in Smyrna today. So the church overcame, and they went through their, test, uh, their testing. There is still a church in Smyrna today. As a matter of fact, 
They meet at 1469 uh, Bornova Street, uh, number 70. They say, uh, across from the tax office. So apparently, they're still undergoing a little bit of persecution uh, uh, being across from the tax office. If you'd like to give them a call after dialing the international code, you may dial 232-422-5988 and you will reach the church in Smyrna that overcame. Their website, very interestingly, still demonstrates a true commitment to Christ. They say thus, and I quote, Christianity is to imitate Jesus to obey his commands, and to desire a life befitting him. Christianity is a matter of faith. You must firmly believe the Bible is the word of the Lord and that what is written in it is true and reliable. The Bible says that Jesus, uh, the Bible says Jesus has died for our sins on the cross. And so look at the commitment of these guys. It's written in Turkish, but there's a, a tab there where you uh, can click and it'll translate the Turkish into English. So uh, just to put things on the positive note that it truly is, the church of Smyrna overcame and they still have a testimony for Jesus in that very city some 2,000 years later. So God bless you guys. You're going to overcome as well. How do I know this? Because the Bible says that he who overcomes is he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. 1 John chapter 5, verse 5. So the Lord bless you. Uh, tune in on, uh, on Tuesday night, 7 p.m. We'll study the book of Jeremiah. May the Lord have his hand upon you, bless you, watch over you, and keep you. Love you guys. We'll see you on Tuesday.